Hi, everybody. I'm John Branningham, and here with Tony Barnstone, who's one of my favorite uh, poets in the world, and certainly one of my favorite poets in LA. And um, I have loved and taught both the Golem of Los Angeles and Tongues of War. And he's out with some, some new poetry, and we want to talk to him about it. So, Tony, why don't we start with a, a poem first? Okay. Uh, well, this is from my new manuscript, which is either called What Rough Beast or After the Fall of America. You kind of get a sense of uh, the darkness of the new manuscript. And the manuscript deals a lot with a lot of political um, questions, but also with changes in society. And this particular one was inspired by a, a podcast about the, the birth of a new form of um, cybernetic creature, the sex robot, uh, which is uh, posited as a possible way of dealing with incels, the involuntary uh, celibate, um, and has some interesting aspects to it, especially those who actually feel that they've fallen in love with their sex robots. Um, so this is called Sex Robot Blues. Her boyfriend looks so human, it's uncanny. It's uncanny how human he looks. In the hills above her house lies a cemetery where the grass spills sun green from the mouths of the dead and ghosts sail through apple trees in the shipwreck light. A pretty image, though it's also true that their mouth is, mouths are stitched and they are drained and embalmed in tight-lit coffins floating in earth. Sometimes that's how she feels living with him. With a subtle eyebrow lift at each crusty dish left in the sink and a death head grin each time she eats ribs, she thinks he's programming her. His fingers clothed in synth tap at her keys. Yet they say you can never really change anybody, that every body changes according to its own program. She walks to Trader Joe's under a street light, blinded by noon, wondering, worrying, what camera has its lifeless eye on me? She pants softly, remembering the feeling of plunging with him in bed like hands of the surf, grabbing her legs and rolling her under their dark applause. She imagines the moment his tongue flicks her switch and makes her twitch towards an explosion that will cinder the armoire and caramelize the picture window. People are broken, and there's no use calling IT about broken people. What if in sleep mode, a computer had a dream? Would it be like his face stretched upon a steel skull? His body like a bulldozer resting in the yellow shade of the lifeguard station, dreaming titanium dreams. Will he wake when the world is red? As if the caress could crush us in its grip. As if, as if. She found a shift in internal code where the differences are. A different kind of code shift. That was before her doctor found tiny bees living inside her eyes, drinking her tears. So that was Sex Robot Blues. Yeah, that's, it seems um, for a, a, a collection about the apocalypse, uh, the lack of human connection and the, the, our, our growing love of, of computers is uh, prescient and uh, I think important. Is, the, is that kind of the theme of the whole book? It, it, it comes up a lot, uh, especially in poems about dating in the digital era. And you have images of, say, couples in bistros on a date, and they're not looking at each other, and they're not talking to each other. They're on their, uh, their, their tablets or their iPhones, swiping and, uh, and tapping. And, um, I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I actually saw a group of young people, my uh, nieces and nephews and their friends, sitting around a table on a beach in Greece having a feast, but they were all on their phones. And some of them were sending each other texts and images, uh, not looking at the ocean around them and uh, not being aware of the extraordinary experience of being in Europe, except to take a snapshot, pop it into Instagram, and then text it to someone across the table. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways, it kind of sums up, I think, um, the way in which we live a mediated life because of the way in which uh, the media has 
has entered into our pockets and it's always sending us messages like strange gods. That's interesting. So they're having like conversations with the people at the table, but through the phone. <laughs> Without looking up, <laughs> through the phones. <laughs> we truly have become cyborgs. <laughs> That's both very funny and very human, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're dealing with environmental poetry as well. Yeah, this has been something that it's come out of my development of a class in eco poetry and my developing of an, something of an like an academic expertise in ecology, eco literature, eco criticism, and uh, eco poetry in order to teach the class and out of interest uh, at a time when I, I think that the whole world is aware that we are spinning towards the trash can as a planet, that we're um, destroying the future for our children and our grandchildren, that we're um, living like rapacious insects eating everything in our path. That um, So yeah, I've been writing uh, ecological poetry and, and uh, it has also to do with some of my editorial work. I, in the last couple of years, I've done a couple of um, guest editing slots. I, I, I guest edited a special issue of the literary magazine Manoa, which focuses on Pacific Rim literature that was uh, American eco poets and Chinese eco poets, and I co co-edited it with uh, Ming Di, the wonderful Chinese poet and translator, Chinese American, and um, and with Frank Stewart, the the series editor, and we put together uh, half Chinese poets and half American poets, all writing eco poetry, along with wonderful art and some um, essays, to talk about uh, that connection. It was fun. Did you find more commonality or differences between the American and the Chinese in the way they, they, they look at poetry or ecology? Um, I, I see interest. I, I see some of the Chinese eco poets are uh, dealing with the changes in their own society. When I first went to China, when I was a very young man, just right out of college, 1984, it was the year of Orwell. <laughs> Uh, and I went to China to teach and um, to accompany my father, who was on the Fulbright. And at that time, it was already pretty polluted because they were using a lot of soft coal in order to heat their uh, their buildings and so on and, and to cook and so on. And so there was a lot of uh, that kind of heavy particulate matter in the air. But at that time, really, nobody had cars. No one had private cars. Uh, they all had bicycles. And I, you know, it's, it's something I can tell you from experience to bicycle to work through uh, rain and sleet storm or a snowstorm in the dead of a Beijing winter. It's quite something. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, everybody has a car or a scooter and the soft coal smoke is accentuated by all the particulate matter that comes out of the vehicles. And so there are many, many days of the year where it's unhealthy for everybody, not just for the elderly or people who've had pneumonia uh, or tuberculosis to go outside. So what I'm trying to say is that that is something that you really see in the eco poetry of, of Chinese poets today. They're aware of how their uh, industrialization, their rush towards uh, the 21st century has come at a human cost. Uh huh. And that, that, so the differences between the Chinese and the American poetry are really just a matter of what we're dealing with environmentally here. Perhaps. I mean, the interesting thing about it also is that eco poetry, the eco criticism here in the West, really is a Chinese invention that has been um, that has immigrated to America through. Uh, really through the British, uh, through British colonialism and um, and through translation, so that uh, through the the uh, the Buddhist tradition, uh, the Taoist tradition uh, in 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 China and uh, of course the Buddhist tradition in India and and, um, and Japan have all deeply influenced American eco poets and not just contemporary ones like Gary Snyder or Allen Ginsberg uh, now more or less contemporary, though he's died, um, but also uh, an earlier generation of ecologists, people like Henry David Thoreau, who were reading the Bhagavad Gita and who had deep, deep influence of, um, of Eastern thinkers uh, from Confucius onward. And so there's a kind of an ethics uh, and really an environmental ethics uh, about how to have good government and good governance of and connection of of nature, right? That you see in 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 the in poets like uh, Wang Wei or um, 
or Han Shan or um, Tao Yuan Ming, Tao Chen. And these, uh, not just the poets, but also the, uh, the essayists and uh, mm. um, those who write parables. And so that becomes something that you see woven through Whitman, Emerson, Thoreau. Um, mm. what, what, for Whitman and Thoreau, were, were these direct, um, direct influences? Or were oh, they def definitely. There, there's a, the, the essays I've read have shown how they had... Uh, uh, had access to early translations of this literature and that, uh, for example, Thoreau was keeping the, the, the Bhagavad Gita on his bedside at, at, uh, at Walden Pond. So there was, and you see, if you start digging around through Walden, you can find it full text online since it's public domain and you start searching for things like Bhagavad Gita and, and so on, uh, um, or Indian yogis, you start finding many, many references and you realize this is an earlier generation that looked to the East, not only for spirituality, but for ideas about nature. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that, um, Although eco-criticism comes from the West to China, as one Chinese critic put it, it came here with a sense of having come home, not like uh, a foreign um, infection coming in. It was, uh, it was as if the ghosts of Zhuangzi, the great Taoist uh, uh, thinker, you know, with the, the, uh, the man who think, dreamed of as a butterfly and never knew whether he was a butterfly or, in fact, uh, a man, um, that is as if, uh, as if the, it was um, it, the, 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 the theory that comes from Zhuangzi had gone to the West and come back. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Oh, that's really So let's think about your poetry then and the influences mm -hmm. of, of uh, Eastern and Western writers on this collection. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you see any direct influences or is it just sort of kind of all up there? I mean, always, because my own spiritual path has been one where uh, I've been less excited by Western iterations of spirituality than by Eastern ones, mm -hmm. with a full understanding that even a peaceful religion like Buddhism can, in places like um, like Myanmar, be used for murder against the Rohingya. That every church is a, 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 a kind of reification of power and a centralization of society so that all the ills of humanity get projected through a church. So there's no good religion really. But I just like the focus on practice that you see in things like Zen Buddhism. And there are many other religions that aren't necessarily from the East that have similar things. You might say that the Holy Rollers or uh, the Snake Handlers um, <laughs> of the South here in America or the, 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 the Sufi dervishes uh, spinning and dancing, that these are ways of getting to the ecstatic state where you change the body and change the mind to try and get in touch with the spiritual. So that my, that's my long way of answering your question is to say that I, whenever I'm dealing with these issues, I've, I'm always um, deeply influenced by my reading and my, my limited practice of Eastern religion. Um, but in truth, the new book I'm writing is a very Western book more than any other that I've written in the past, because mm -hmm. it's really dealing with what I see as breakdowns in Mm, the ideals of our society, the uh, erosion of democratic norms in the era of Trump, the, uh, the ways in which I see, sadly, uh, people turning away from their patriotism, their ideal connection to what America can be, the best America that we can be, and to a uh, naked grab for power. Maybe that's always been the case, but it seems worse now than in the past, and how that manifests in, well, for example, uh, the you know, the evisceration of things like the Environmental Protection Agency, where they put anti-environmentalists in charge who believe in, um, or at least are, are presenting ideas that are completely scientifically discounted, such as that getting a little bit of radiation poisoning or mercury poisoning is good for you, that it functions as, um, as a kind of prophylactic to keep you from getting sick crazy ideas, but the Environmental Protection Agency in the um, hands of these anti-environmentalists is, is actually giving credence to these ideas that will make us sick. Oh, that's extraordinary. Yeah. Well, we're talking about that. Um, do you have a poem that, that typifies? What you're I do. About? I do. Uh, I think what I might do is, uh, is read a poem that's, uh, I have several of them, but I'm going to um, read one poem that's called The Locusts. 
And you'll see, in fact, that the locusts, I mean, it's us. We, we, are, uh, we have met the enemy and it, and, and, and it is us. <laughs> and they are us. Um, it has a, uh, an epigraph from Alistair Crowley. And they shall eat up everything that is upon the earth. Hmm. Uh, I'm thinking about the fact that we have 7.4 billion people on, on the planet now. Uh, less than 3 billion when I was born. It's more than doubled. And so what it means is that if something becomes popular, whatever it is, we will devastate the earth to make a shortage of it. You know, whether it's salmon or seaweed or whatever, whatever's popular in the moment, we'll, we'll just devastate the world's resources and eat it all up because there are so many of us. And, um, it, 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 it actually, for me, it, it creates a great moral conundrum because I am a, I'm very much a child of the Enlightenment, although I see the problems with the Enlightenment, which, of course, came about at a time of uh, rapacious colonialism, yeah. uh, slavery, racism, and all the rest. But nonetheless, there are ideas which they didn't necessarily put into practice, except maybe through certain experiments like the French Revolution, which of course led to the terror, or the American Revolution, which of course was hand in hand with slavery. So, um, but nonetheless, ideals that have failed, ideals nonetheless of the uh, natural human rights that are, we are born into, and the right of all of us to, um, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The only problem is when there are 7.4 billion of us doing that, then things start happening like, um, you can't make a moral statement that the people of China and India should not be driving automobiles when the people of Orange County and, um, and Sarasota, Florida are, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when those billions of people do, as they have done in the last 20, 30 years, get uh, wide access to automobiles, then it accelerates the carbon emissions into the atmosphere so that we move ever closer to environmental disaster through climate change. So there's the issue, right? Um, our own rapacious consumerism in America, instead of being something that's a warning to others, becomes a lesson to be emulated and we move faster and faster to our, towards our own destruction um, because we're using the wrong models how Americans live. The locusts. Locusts, um, grasshoppers, of course, are locusts. They just go through a change. They molt and turn into locusts, and then they get, get wings, and they fly around in the billions, and they eat everything in their path. At first, each short-horned hopper with its strange striped eyes and spotted green sea glass shell is solitary as a hermit in his cabin by a pond. But when the planet warms beneath the iron sky, each female nymph sheds a thousand eggs per day. They open beneath a skin of dirt and bodies on bodies like a mosh pit surging, small hoppers mob the surface and strip branches down to whiten bone. And that's when the change comes. They molt, shedding green for yellow black and rub back legs together like a bow and string until an odd music starts. And serotonin cascades in their brains as they cluster and throng, seven billion strong, e pluribus unum, chittering in mobs with dreamlike violence, buzz, 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 sound into fury, and one jostles another and takes a sharp bite from its arm and a chemical signature stains the air and then all its neighbors swarm the wounded one and feed. In his tent, a desert entomologist dreams his throat is choked with sand and eyes crusted with ants and scientists begin to plan mass slaughters, the algorithm of fire, because numbers constitute the only universal language and that language is death but it's already too late. 
It's been too late for a long time now. Already these locusts have discovered their wings, shaking them a bit like wet umbrellas, shedding the dust, tentatively opening each wing diaphanous as a twilight speckled with moon and stars. As they rise in a sandstorm of fire, a galaxy of craving, a billion tiny hands clapping in strange applause. The sun goes out. They cover the ground black. The ones in front fly faster in fear of the mouths of the ones behind. Yet when the first of them arrive in our town, the man sitting on a park bench doesn't look up from his iPhone. And at his feet, his baby crushes a hopper in her little fist, not knowing how could any of us know how easily everything can be crushed. Oh, that's interesting. That's a powerful poem, right? And mm, it's a bit it's, apocalyptic. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's it's not it's not it's not joyful. Um, no, <laughs> your poetry has never been right. Um, I well, there, no. Some of some of your earlier uh, love sonnets were were particularly joyful. My very first book, uh, Impure was actually designed to be a book that was against the idea of depressing, sad um, poetry. They're supposed to be all about joy, riffing off of Walt Whitman and uh, William Cullis Williams dancing naked and throwing his shirt over his head uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, in, and that kind of uh, joyful thing. Although there were some um, sad poems in there as well, but there, yeah, there's a, there's, I would say there's a, it's, it's a, it's a dark vision. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, is, is it a totally hopeless vision? I mean, this poem says it's already too late. Yeah, okay. I, I think that we need to think beyond the Anthropocene, which is to say, think beyond the human. Mm -hmm. It might be that all the things to which we are committed, our families, our society, our culture, poetry, art, um, joy in humanity um, will go away. Mm -hmm. But the world won't end, and we might cause millions of ex uh, species to go extinct, but other ones will come in their place. Life will go on. It just might not be human life. Now, from my point of view, that's a great tragedy, and probably from your point of view and from most people's point of view. At the same time, if we destroy ourselves, we don't actually destroy the planet. We just make it uninhabitable for ourselves. Uh-huh. That that that's a that's a hopeful. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 on a. Um, I mean, there, every poet has some sort of mission, right? You're mm -hmm. you're on a bit of a mission. And I'm just wondering about the editing that you've been doing. You mentioned Manoa earlier. Does that help? Does that do you see that as part of your larger mission as a poet? Um, in other words, do you, do you spread it more as an editor than as an individual poet? Yeah, I mean, these things uh, they fell into my lap a bit. Um, but I also think that they have something to do with, um, I've been writing books, of course, but the editing work is a way in which I can give back to the community mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, you know, every time you publish someone, you're giving a double gift. On the one hand, you're giving a gift of something you think is fantastic to the literary reading world. And on the other hand, you're doing something really nice for the author. You're giving them that pat on the back, the imprimatur of, of congratulations that says, yes, this is, this is something that, sh that, that belongs in the collection. And so it's a way of being nice to the community that's, uh, that's promoted and supported me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of what that's about. Yeah. Well, your, your other big editing project has been with Pradik, uh, it's a magazine. It, it's, it's out of India, isn't it? Yes, uh, the editor lives in Nepal, but it's published in India, but it's distributed via small press distribution in Amazon, in America, and across the world. And this is a very interesting journal. It's an international literary journal in English, uh, edited by a wonderful poet who actually studied with David Ray, uh, did his MFA here in America, and um, uh, his name is Yuyutsa Sharma. Wonderful, wonderful poet. You should check him out. Uh, he's got some fantastic uh, books out there. I love his um, his New York poems, which is uh, his vision of New York that riffs off of Federico Garcia's uh, poet in New York, that wonderful surreal book. And he, uh, uh, whereas uh, in 
in Lorca, you have uh, kind of a, a, a the the Roma slash gypsy uh, vision of um, kind of a magical New York, but also a nightmarish New York. And in Sharma's vision, it's uh, Kali and other Hindu gods that are kind of uh, inhabiting the <laughs> capitalistic, strange, materialistic, exciting uh, metropolis of New York. And so it's, it's a whole, it's a similar but different, surreal and also spiritual. So uh, anyways, so that's Sharma and he's the one who's um, the general editor of this, and he does a lot of special issues. Um, the poets of uh, Ireland, the, or Great Britain, or Australia, or um, uh, in our case, uh, Los Angeles, and um, or, or from around the world. Um, not and so they're um, with, with different guest editors and translation issues as well, French poets and so on. Um, so that's uh, that, that's the exciting project. It, it, again, this is sort of giving back to the Los Angeles poetry community. I've now been in Los Angeles long enough that I guess I'm a Los Angeles poet. Yeah. I came here in 1995. How many years is that? 25 years ago. Yeah. So, you came from Indiana, didn't you? Well, I grew up in Indiana. I went to college at, in Wesleyan and Connecticut and then at UC Santa Cruz and then UC Berkeley. So um, in, from college through master's through PhD, I was... Um, a California guy, and uh, then uh, you know a year in China, and then came back. And then a year in China, a year in uh, New Mexico, and and then came back for my job. So I've really been in California since nineteen eighty one, eighty one. Yeah, yeah. A long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we why don't we finish with a a poem from your a, a third poem from your new collection? Sure. Uh, maybe I'm going to do a political poem. Right. This is a collection that is very much a collection that was birthed uh, out of a desire to find ways to write political poetry in the era of Trump. And for me, it's difficult because I have a lot of issues with political poetry. Um, mm -hmm. I, I find that when you yell at people, they tend to close their ears. When you preach at people, they don't, they, they tend to say, you know, not, not listen to you. And yet uh, preachers do a pretty good job of it, right? Then when they get up on the pulpit, there's a certain charisma, there's a certain rhetorical strategy. Um, they often use parables uh, as, uh, uh, and before they give the application. And then there are political poets I became particularly interested in, uh, people like Kevin Prufer and Allen Ginsberg, Walt Whitman, Pablo Neruda, uh, and others who use a kind of long line poetics, often blended together with a kind of surrealism or um, kind of uh, surrealism that is tamed a bit so that you know, there's a little bit of weirdness thrown in there, a, a bit of a shift so that you you get these unexpected elements that, the, that make it less boring because political poetry is boring because once you know what the political stance of the person is, you pretty much know where it's going. So you, the, the point is to keep people off balance. I'm talking about this. I'll talk about that. Now I'm talking about this and if somehow it comes together. At least that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So uh, I could read, um, maybe I'll read a, a, a sort of longer one. This is called Elegy for Liberty Blues. And um, Again, it has a lot to do with what I see as the decline of American norms. Uh, in many ways, I think it goes back to Bush v. Gore when the Supreme Court essentially did a coup d'etat and said, well, we are majority Republican and several of us are retiring. We want to have a Republican president so that we replace other Republicans. Let's put Bush into office instead of Gore, which is what they did. And it was part of the big power grab that led to uh, Citizens United and other um, and the kind of the, uh, the, the, the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act and other things that have undermined our democracy leading us to where we are now uh, with a undermined court system and undermined um, Congress and an undermined um, executive branch. So having said that, Elegy for Liberty Blues. America, I dreamed I saw you alive again last night. Twitter was riddled with rumors you'd been abducted. Maybe you had died. But there you were, wearing your cloak of twilight, stars spangling your hair. And you looked at me the way you used to before things turned strange and bad somewhere, before you became the goddess of drones, the prison queen. I don't blame you, do I? I know you had a violent childhood. 
we never really get over these things. You told me once you were a human lighthouse, that the surf off Manhattan crawled to shore like huddled masses. So I need to ask what changed in you? America, I thought you loved me. We raised a murderous child together. The empty sky is raining fingers. Somebody flew an airplane into the towers of night. They smashed the city teeth, and now your sky is a shipwreck. Your toxic fumes vacuum into our lungs. I forget what I was saying. I was saying something. I'm speaking this poem to you on the freeway, trying not to die. I know your freeways aren't free, that your highways take the low road, but please stop tailgating me with your monster truck. Your wind is trying to undulate the flaccid flag. Your spirit ripples palm tree fronds. Your face is a locked door. America, I want more. Going to California with a suitcase in my hand, actually I drove there in a carpet cleaning van and all the way from Indiana, the highway was littered with your refuse, those you refused, the refuseniks, the ones whose cars broke down and waited on the roadside and fell in doomed love with the mechanic who picked them up in his pickup truck and never left this nowhere town with a gas station and a mini mall south of the interstate. Another roadside passion, that's what I had for you. Another drive-by fatality, that's what I was to you. I'm driving by Cherry Lane, Target and Food for Less. The Subaru in front of me has a license plate that says, Thirsty. The grinning skull-faced grill of a smashed sedan eyes me from the car carrier. My son came home and said, Daddy, there are strangers who want to take us away. When they come, we have to lock the door and hide in the back room. America, why do you love your firearms more than you love me? Your life had stood a loaded gun, something the undertaker understood. I undertake to understand how it was that you loved me, even as your finger around the trigger curled. Well, um, it continues with the uh, theme of, of apocalypse, right? Lost, <laughs> uh, of a world gone strange and awry, yeah. Um, okay. Do you think you've become more pessimistic as the years have gone by? Uh, I think I've always been a critical thinker about all this stuff. I remember back when I was a teenager, and this was Vietnam, and I was of that generation that had the war not ended and had Jimmy Carter not abolished the draft, would have been drafted and had to go off and fight and die. And so I was looking that in the face as a teenager. Um, I was just a couple of years too young for that to happen to me. And I was growing up in Indiana where the news media is pretty much right-wing propaganda and even was back then. And I was enough of a critical thinker to say, hmm, they're lying to me. Mm. And uh, so I began to... Uh, collate all the news sources I could find to try and see whether I could read through all the different editorial slants to find the real news, something I was doing as a teenager. So I think I was pretty pessimistic early on. And uh, I remember, you know, my friends were hippies or kind of pseudo hippies because we were young. But we had the idea that came from rock and roll songs and, you know, the Beatles and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and, and others, as well as um, poetry and other things we were reading. Um, Martin Luther King and Gandhi and all the rest, that uh, what would it be like if the basis for an economy were not money, but love? Mm -hmm. An impossible thing to imagine, right? Uh, the idea of corporations based on mm, their, their responsibility to the people. Mm -hmm. The idea of, of a government uh, that's really not about serving business, but about serving people, about a society that's not about getting attention maybe by shooting up a kindergarten, but rather about connecting with people. That, I was thinking about this stuff, yeah, at 14. Yeah, well, that, that's a very optimistic way of looking at, at the world, isn't it? Rather well, it, it feels far away, but maybe we can get back there. Yeah. Okay, well, that, I think that's a great place to, to end our discussion. Thank you, John. It's been a lot of fun.
Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, thank you all.